Okay, uh, I'd like to say uh, a few uh, things before we open it uh, to questions and answers. And uh, I first uh, thank all my friends, the panelists, for doing a good job, great job. And uh, one, uh, I start like with uh, Luciano. Uh, he uh, identified uh, problems uh, in Hawaii uh, and uh, in terms of uh, what the planners uh, rely upon and this is like population projection so you have like more people we're gonna build more for them so housing stocks are up so it's great uh, for real estate but uh, that's not good for agriculture or uh, environment and so forth uh, so that's one uh, uh, problem that is uh, that guides those particular planner, planners. Uh, taxation is another, and then land use planning. And uh, you know, I just want to point out that uh, there's a big fight right now about the DLNR, right? And this is something that is really critical for all of us uh, in terms of uh, land use planning and what uh, can be done uh, in terms of. Uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, and who should be uh, the uh, guard on that one? Is it the Casaban Cook guy or someone else who uh, has the interest of the people at heart? Uh, so uh, that's like in terms of Luciano uh, pointing out uh, the problem. Um, I want to say something about. Uh, all the panelists, as they talked, uh, of course, uh, everyone uh, agreed that uh, we have problems and we don't need the panelists to tell us that we have problems. But uh, what is important to uh, recognize is that these problems are structural. And not only structural in terms of how the system, like the city, for instance, or the state, uh, have their institutions built, but the structural in terms of the particular uh, 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 way of how, they or, uh, how the economy is organized, the way in which the economy is organized. And here I go to John Wittig, uh, who talked about uh, capitalism as uh, the larger structural problem. And I agree wholeheartedly with that uh, because uh, it's a matter of, uh, some people might think like if we, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, adjust this uh, this kind of policy and then readjust the other one then everything will be hunky dory uh, not uh, recognizing the fact or neglecting in fact the fact that in, in fact what is important to consider is the question of who has control in uh, you know in terms of the decision making processes in Hawaii uh, is it uh, <clears throat> We, the people who go and elect X, Y, or Z, or is it someone else who has control? Is it Castle and Cook? Is it uh, Alexander and Baldwin? Is it uh, the real estate guys? Is it uh, uh, Sheraton, Hilton, and the rest of them? Um, and so forth. So these are important things to consider, especially if we want to like uh, battle those kinds of issues, we have to know uh, what the problems are, one, and who is the person or the entity or entities that we need to um, struggle against, shall we say, or uh, compel them to do what we need, not that what, what they need. So in terms of then building social movements, political movements, it's uh, critical to figure out these uh, uh, structural problems and uh, know who's, uh, you know, as they say, a military friend or foe, you know. Uh, the other uh, thing, I think, uh, in terms of, uh, like when John looked at it, uh, you know, uh, presenting the, uh, the problem, he um, located uh, what's happening in Hawaii uh, in terms of the larger global picture and also, you know, in terms of capitalism, etc. and then what uh, the havoc that uh, capitalism and uh, those big powers uh, reap on um, uh, many innocent lives uh, all over the globe. Uh, I don't have to tell you about what's happening in the Middle East right now, and so forth. Uh, so I think that is uh, an important consideration to look at uh, the environment in which uh, things occur, whether it's in Hawaii or Tahiti or uh, Micronesia and so forth. 
The, uh, the other thing in terms of uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie uh, uh, looked at uh, the problem in terms of agriculture, in terms of development, and so forth, um, by looking at you know, what's happening in the United States, and then we can begin to imagine that, uh, in fact, what's happening in Hawaii is not, is, uh, not uh, different from what's going on in the United States in terms of growth rather than development. I mean, the notion that growth is good, well, growth for whom? You know, why not have development for the, uh, in the interest of the majority of the population? And this is a critical matter here. And as we talk about growth, development, and so forth, uh, we then would have to talk about what kind of uh, social movements, political movements do we need to have to begin to make change in uh, this particular system that we have. And here, uh, you know, since we, are li we live in Hawaii, uh, I mean, we cannot just talk about development or growth or what have you or any kind of problem without really recognizing that at the center of this is the indigenous question. And uh, the uh, indigenous question is uh, very important uh, because uh, as we know, like, uh, who lost the land in the first place and how they lost the land, etc., because of uh, colonialism, settler colonialism, and uh, imperialism. So, these are important considerations for us to look at in terms of reimagining our communities, uh, reimagining how education, and, uh, you know, uh, panelists talked about that, how education should be, like, should we pay tuition, for instance. Uh, Reimagining politics, uh, so I'm not going to vote for X, Y, or Z, maybe I want to vote for A, B, and C who are part of this political movement that we are, um, you know, creating to um, turn things around, shall we say. Reimagining a, a different kind of economy and so forth. So I just want to stop there and uh, thank you again, panelists, for doing, um, you know, uh, helping us uh, think about all these things. Uh, John reminded me that uh, to uh, to inform you that uh, he has his paper. He's gonna give me his paper, and whoever is uh, uh, would like to look at it, at the the entire thing and the uh, suggestions and proposal, um, you know, just contact me. I'm in the Department of Ethnic Studies, and uh, we can make this one available to you. So anyway, we have uh, wow, we have. Uh, pretty good time, like 15 minutes or so, for uh, Q&A. Um, I just, you know, uh, open it up, uh, asking you perhaps uh, to have a, if you have a comment, uh, please make it short. If you have a question, uh, also make it short so we can have like more uh, questions and answers as much as possible. So, it's open to you guys. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. I, I think um, your speech was one of the best I've heard because of the concerns we have today. But for Luciano, you teach urban and regional planning. And I would suspect some of your students are in city planning, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But the fact that the Howard Hughes Corporation is thinking of 22 or plus, that whole area having 22 or plus, um, condominiums, rentals, whatever they may be. Um, do you see any problem if they hit water tables and the piping to make those buildings strong going into the ground at such a condensed area? Yeah, Thank you for the question. It's an engineering question, so uh, soil engineer, geologist would have uh, a better answer than uh, I might have, but certainly suburbanization of central Oahu and Eva uh, greatly impair the water lands uh, and uh, studying of current capacity of Pearl Harbor Aquifer were done in the past. And uh, the human settlement standard that we use, uh, I don't believe uh, in general that are suitable for the fragile ecology of our island, including Oahu. 
So um, I think you are right in asking these questions because we should do a much better job in um, planning our uh, human segment. And that's what I didn't have time to go into. I have the feeling that we lost uh, the battle of protecting agricultural land in Central Loapo. And even because we had say, we said only we need agricultural land. We should have said we can design better cities that are more human scale, more pedestrian uh, oriented, and more affordable. Thank you. And I did like your idea of low rise to high rise. And um, I would hope some housing is going to be senior housing. And don't count those seniors walking down those stairs if the electricity goes off and they can't use the elevator. So this type of mentality needs to be incorporated, you know? And, um, and I'd like a copy of your paper, John. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I want to ask, please. Uh, well, on senior housing, uh, in fact, uh, if we integrate a senior citizen with family, I will introduce the concept of the extended family, the Ohana, that is an indigenous idea that would be great for our community, would provide also part-time employment for the senior. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Development is not built for affordability. Development is built for profit. The banks give the money to the corporates to invest and to make a profit. It's not the other way around that if we vote for Nakashima, Tanaka, Nuoroka, Masonara, then they're going to change everything on the political on the political uh, platform at the state legislature. They cannot do that. They are not empowered to do that. What can do that and make change is to go out. Well, before we go out, we need to be due diligent. We need to do our research. We need to write out our plans. And the same way how we went out to organize for Kalama Valley, Wahole Waitani, Alama Housing, Kahuko Housing, and all that time in the early 70s needs to be done again and be done because the help is not coming from uh, other sources. I'm not going to mention names because, you know, everybody's going to take it the wrong way. But the, the thing is that uh, once we understand the animal that we deal with, you know, because I've been involved in development uh, at Kalama Valley, uh, I call it Halama Housing. In the process of being evicted, Native Hawaiian children, Native Hawaiian women, Native Hawaiian colonies were exposed to the brutality and the terrorism of the construction industry, of HPD, of the National Guard, so on and so forth. So I share with you that terrorism does exist. It's in the eyes and the fears in the hearts of little cakes. Little cakes who you probably never ran across them in your life. But they exist. They are part of our community. Communities. So all I ask is that we do our due diligence and that we prepare for war. Concerning paradigm shifts, 
Um, when I was a, a student, I worked with Marion Kelly, who's um, a wonderful person who helped to start ethnic studies and who also was an anthropologist who actually listened to the people that she interviewed and who lived in, in communities. And one of the things that I was given by her to do was to sit in her Bishop Museum office and to count all the loki that she had counted over her lifetime, and then to go with her into remote valleys and count the number of loki. And from that came some of the estimations of the population before our time. And I'm just um, remembering that and thinking that one of the valuable things in that information is that it was not only a measure of the population at that time, but of food production that was needed to support the life of the population at that time. And one of the things that I think we need to look at in paradigm shifts is that there are things that have happened before that can teach us. So in Denmark, after World War II, some of the Jewish children who escaped um, the pogroms were put on dairy farms and they learned how to create powdered milk. And after the war, some of them who were dairy farmers went all over the world and taught people how to create powdered milk. So one of the questions I was asking the tarot farmers, we made about five films on Akwat knowledge, and Charlie was in, in one of them to show that people in that generation were returning to farming. And one of the things that I asked the tarot farmers was, could we make powdered poi? because it's uh, hypoallergenic. Gerber did this huge study on poi to be a uh, you know, possible uh, food, baby food at one point. And could this be uh, a global food? And then over the years, in listening to what people are buying on the market and what billionaires say about the economy, um, one of the things that uh, comes up is that not only some of our root crops, as well as Apollo, but like, ginseng and ginger and turmeric and other things like that, go for huge amounts of money in China. And what billionaires say is, if you want to make a billion dollars overnight, find a place that has a billion people. You can keep your prices low, but you can, can make the, the money from that. And because our water laws are tied to our tarot production, I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can connect the dots so that the next billionaires in Hawaii become the tarot farmers, and then the tarot farmers are making some of the decisions with all the rest of us who are the people of this island that, like Kalani says, has enough of, of a clout that we can actually make these decisions without, without having to appeal to a capitalistic system that's only um, profit incentive driven. So mahalo. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Actually, um, Hong Kong has been making taro flour for a long time, and I make it too. I have a very old oven with a pilot light, so the temperature of my oven is about 100 degrees. So I dehydrate a lot of stuff. I dehydrate taro, I dehydrate uru, make uru flour out of that, cassava. You make flour out of that too, so there is a lot of um, potential there to do that kind of thing. Um, the tower production is kind of interesting. Today we have less than 400 acres of tower statewide. In contact, there is probably, you know, there's various estimates, there's probably like 20,000 acres. And, um, but the thing about the the tower production today compared to back then, you know, they, they probably, the stuff that I've read, I think they fallowed their fields maybe once every three years or so, and this would be a time when they would be gathering as much organic matter as they could and putting it back into the field, you know, to bring the fertility of their, their fields back up again. So, and when people talk about food sustainability, it's those kinds of things, the organic matter, those kinds of practices that we need to we need to think about. Because great, we can buy local, you know, eat local food and stuff. But is it really local food if it's grown with fertilizer that's coming from outside? Um, the United States uses like 50 some million tons of fertilizer a year. Hawaii imports 
somewhere around 100,000 tons of fertilizer. So when we're looking at, at how we do our agricultural systems, we need to look at that as a, as a factor of sustainability is what are the inputs that are put in there. I mean, I talked a lot about the labor inputs, but um, we also have to look at those, those other inputs. So when we farm, we need to look at how we're gonna do that kind of fertilization and, and that kind of thing. And if we're looking at food self-sufficiency, um, starch is really, is really the key issue, the key item because we would need a lot of acres of starch if we were going to feed everybody you know, locally here. And, and again, you know, that, that taro is, is a really important um, starch when it comes to that. Hawaiians grew, if they could, they grew wetland rather than dry land. Um, we, have, we have a lot of streams on these islands, so that was the irrigation source. Um, so you wouldn't have to worry you know, about irrigation, if you could divert a stream and you could and irrigate the tar field that way. Um, they, they also, it was also wetland, they got, a, they got a higher yield wetland than dry land, they got a higher starch content, more food. So that wetland, that wetland was really important for them. And the other important thing about all those streams and everything and the importance of that, I mean, tar is part of the whole ecological system. Um, and that fresh water, that water that goes into, into a hollow patch, into a tower patch, eventually goes back into the stream, either through the ground or, or just directly back into the stream. And all that stream water ends up down in the ocean. And those, those, that estuarine system, that mixing of salt water and fresh water is key to all of our, all of our fisheries on all the islands. Like Kona doesn't have you know, they're not streams over there, but there's a huge amount of fresh water that comes out into the ocean. And that's why the fishing is so good off of that, off of that coast. They say that the main reason for declining fish catches worldwide is overfishing. But the second reason for declining fish catches is diversion of, of fresh water away from the ocean. So if we're looking at sustainability, that, that whole ecosystem is really important. Well, Mahalo, we are uh, flat out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the panelists. And I remind you, 3 o'clock, uh, another panel, Aloha Aina, a debate about the future of the Lahue of the Hawaii. So hopefully you stay. Forever.